abortion facility in this state when we have hundreds of pregnancy resource centers all across our country. I'm 17 and I'm having a little girl. How is it that you don't want her, but you are forcing me to keep her? Honestly, if I'd had a child with that man, I, I'd have killed myself. Dads and moms, come out of this place. This place is a place of murder. Are you going, are you going to take care of these babies? Go to the public aid office and tell them to quit having babies. You worried about somebody else's business. It's not just I just want to graduate high school and then go to college. What are you going to do about all the women that need abortions? I can't believe that I am a citizen of a country that says it's okay to kill a baby. I look at it helping a young woman get on with her life. People telling their stories is so important because we keep those things locked inside of ourselves and they kill us. Let's get this party started. All right. <laughs> I am so excited to be here with you discussing this film. It's so excellent. Um, so to kind of just start us off, why make a documentary about abortion? Oh my goodness. Um, I mean, it, it, it was hard for me to take on and I'm not sure I would have done it had I not had to amazing uh, executives behind me at HBO Documentary Films, Sheila Nevins and Sarah Bernstein, um, as much as we need more women filmmakers in the world. We also need more sort of badass female executives in the world like them. So I really do have to give a shout out to them because I'm not sure I would have had the bravery without them behind me to take it on. Um, but of course, this is a really, really timely issue, even though it's 2016 and it's been 43 years since Roe v. Wade. Um, women's rights are being threatened and in places like Missouri there's one abortion provider and uh, and a 72 hour waiting period and many many other hurdles that women face in accessing care and you grew up in Missouri right so what was it like kind of going back there and looking at a place you had previously lived through this lens well I mean I it's a place that I love and have a great connection with, and there's so much about it that I appreciate. Um, but it's also really sad what's happening there right now. Um, and I feel for women there. Um, it's a very, very conservative state right now. There's a super majority in the House and Senate, and many, many extremely conservative um, laws are being passed and they just keep passing. So I hope with this recent Supreme Court ruling, perhaps um, some of those laws will be challenged. But. Yeah, it feels pretty timely given how much women's health has come up politically, uh, especially given that it's an election year. How do you think a rhetoric around abortion is playing into the political campaigns that are going on this year? Well, I mean, the purpose of this film was really to, um, you know, to create a piece to tell stories that were not political, to kind of reclaim the conversation because it's so often, we've he all heard the rhetoric. I mean, we've all heard it. We know exactly what's gonna come out of somebody's mouth before it comes out of their, you know, a politician. But, but we don't hear much from women directly, women who are affected, women who have unplanned pregnancies, women who are seeking abor abortion care. Um, and these stories are very, very important to get out there because when you talk about something like this in the abstract, you know, it's easy to dismiss um, or it's easy to make past judgment or it's easy to say what you would do. But until you hear from women directly and look in their eyes and hear their stories, it, you know, it's, um, 
uh, yeah, you, you, it's important. It's important. Absolutely. And the film is kind of bookended with one woman's story, Amy, who's a 30-year-old single mother. Um, why did you choose to focus so much on her narrative? Well, it, it felt in many ways very average. Um, I mean, sometimes, you know, it's okay to share the stories that are like the good abortions when it's the fetal anomalies and it's pregnancies maybe that are planned or wanted and well, of course, in this case, or circumstances of, you know, where a woman is raped, or, you know, so there are kind of abortions that are more acceptable. And Amy's story is, is very, very average. She's a working woman. She has two kids. She's working two jobs. Um, and this is a very rational, uh, important choice for her to make both for herself and her family. So it felt, it felt like a good, a good story to really lean on. And there is such a diversity of women that we hear from in this film, which is amazing. And we don't just hear from women who have chosen to have abortions or work you know, at an abortion clinic. We hear from women who are actually really active in the anti-abortion movement. Why did you decide to include those voices as well? It was very important that, again, this not be seen as a political piece or an advocacy film. I wanted to hear from women. I wanted to open it up. And so as part of that, it meant listening to women who have different ideologies, come from a different religious backgrounds, um, hear from all of them. And that's part of, you know, it's when we talk about these laws that are being passed, you know, you can't legislate for all the different circumstances women are going to face. At, you know, one size does not fit all. Um, and certainly, you know, this film needed to include the voices of, of many and, and, and those perspectives as well. Something that struck me uh, when hearing from some of these women who are so staunchly anti-abortion was that some of the most vocal ones had actually had abortions, sometimes multiple abortions. Did that surprise you? Well, it, it did surprise me, and then, of course, I spent a lot of time at Hope Clinic for Women and heard that from their experience as providers, that wasn't, you know, a unique or special situation at all, that, you know, a woman might be on the sidewalk one day, a patient the next day, and back on the sidewalk the next day. Um, you know, which I, you know, again, as a filmmaker, I don't want to just make films about people that are like me or that believe exactly what I believe. I mean, I think that's part of uh, what's important for me in my filmmaking is to try to um, make connections with people that I don't necessarily agree with or I don't necessarily, you know, that aren't, I, I'm not just seeing myself. Um, but it was hard to understand how you could have multiple abortions when you wanted them, when you needed them and then somehow want to deny someone else that same right. And you brought up Hope Clinic, which is a clinic just um, over the border in Illinois. And a good portion of the documentary takes place within that clinic. How did you find that clinic and why did you choose to focus on the women who, who work there? Well, our first day of shooting, so the trailer that you saw at the beginning and the, um, you know, All in Christ, that was our very first day of filming. Um, and it was on the eve of this 72-hour waiting period becoming law. Um, and so there were people on both sides out to either try to make sure that this law didn't pass or that this law would pass. Um, and... Unfortunately, the law did pass. There's a 72-hour waiting period in Missouri now, and that had a real and significant effect for women. Um, it meant that many women went over state lines to Illinois to access care because the 72 hours was just an undue burden to face. So, um, so that was part of the reason, is that this, this clinic right over state lines. And then I also met Dr. Aaron, um, who is the one of the providers there. And we had, um, you know, we had a connection and she trusted me. I'm grateful for that trust because um, it's hard for them. Uh, providers are certainly under attack a lot every day. And, uh, and you know, it's hard to keep going on um, 
with that. But, um, but she trusted me, so I'm grateful. And, and, and that was how we ended up there. Yeah, and I think some of those voices are so important. I mean, it was fascinating to me that you interviewed, you know, the female security guard who works at the clinic. She's a character. Do you want to talk a little bit about, about her? I mean, I, I love Chi-Chi. Chi-Chi is just kind of the cut straight through it. Um, you know, she, she really was uh, the protector <laughs> of this place, this community of women. Um, and that's really, a, in making this film, Hope Clinic was such a community of women. Um, there was one male provider there as well, but um, for the most part it was women, women nurses, women doctors, women receptionists, and then the patients coming through. And she, you know, it was her job to greet the patients and to make sure that the protesters didn't cross the line. And she's kind of tough and didn't take, you know, <laughs> she, she would tell you what to do. And I would certainly want Chi Chi being my security um, if I ever needed it. So, yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, her, her back and forth, for anyone who hasn't seen the film, her back and forth with some of the protesters was kind of incredible. She chose to engage with them and a way that was... Yeah, you know, and it, she also, you know, people can be very, um, it's, this is really hard. You know, nobody sets out to have an unplanned pregnancy or to seek abortion care necessarily. It's not on, you know, a list of something that somebody necessarily plans for in their life. It's unplanned. But, um, but I think the thing that I really appreciate about her also is that she has a dose of humor and she makes the patients feel um, like they're not alone. She has had an abortion herself and often shares that with the women coming in, that they're not alone and don't feel bad and you're not going to hell, are you kidding me? You know, don't worry about, you know, then that's Chi Chi. And, you know, if only there were more women like her giving support um, to women seeking abortion care, that would be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what do you think, you know, when you kind of look at the state of the way we talk about abortion in this country, what do you think is missing from that discourse? Well, I mean, the voices of women, and that's what this film is all about, is really, um, I hope, you know, encouraging that, encouraging storytelling, encouraging sharing, um, so that it's not something that is seen as strange or other or criminal. I mean, we made a real intention to show women's faces, not to just show feet or hands, um, but to ask women to speak on camera and, and sh let us into their lives. That was really important so that it, it, it humanizes this. Um, uh, and I think that's very important. You know, that's, I, I hope the film can have that impact um, even just a little bit. Did you find it pretty easy to find women who were eager to tell their stories? No, no. It's, this is a hard thing um, still to talk about. I think here in New York, maybe it's easier. In Missouri especially, it's not so easy. I mean, there are billboards all over the place about, you know, don't kill your baby. Um, again, there's a conservative House and Senate in, in the state capitol. Uh, it's the buckle of the Bible Belt. Um, so it's not a real conducive place for women to talk about health care, their needs. Um, there's also abstinence-based sex education. And, of course, that's where it all starts, right? Being educated about how babies are made um, and having access to birth control. Uh, these are very, very important things that also are compromised for many women in Missouri. So it was not easy to talk about. Just to, I mean, it was, it was not easy to come forward. But some women wanted to, in part for themselves, like Amy, to say, I'm a human being. I'm not a bad person. This is who I am. I'm a mother. I've got two jobs. This is what I need to do. Don't judge me. Um, and then she also did that for other women who would follow. So that, you know, it's a very, very generous act. Um, and then other women just couldn't come forward because they feared for the repercussions within their homes, their families, their workplaces, but they supported the film and were grateful that the film was being made. And if there's one thing that people who see this film take away from it, what do you hope that is? 
Well, you know, I don't necessarily think um, that anybody's mind is going to be changed. You know, I, I don't think it's about, um, uh, yeah, changing people's minds. But I do hope it, it, it might have an effect on people's hearts. Um, you know, I'm asking audiences to walk in these women's shoes a little bit and to, ex to understand the circumstances women face. And I hope that that has some impact to bring a bit more compassion and empathy um, to the conversation and away from this abstract political place where there's a lot of like damning to hell and this is what you have to do under every single circumstance. You know, it's a very private, personal matter and it obviously deeply affects women's lives and their futures and they need to be able to make that kind of choice for themselves. Well, I think the human stories really just come across so much in the movie, and it's, it's incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, and how do you select projects that you work on in general? You know, do you look for one nugget, one small story, or do you kind of hone in on a topic and go from there? I don't, you know, it's a little bit of an organic process. I mean, for me, it's very important to have a personal connection. Um, Ultimately, even if I'm thinking about something from the top down, it, it has to be grounded in the personal and in a very intimate place. Um, I, I started off with this film knowing that I wanted to find women and it was all going to be about the women. Um, I certainly cared about the circumstances and I cared about what was happening in Missouri, but it was not about, you know, I, I covered the debate just a little bit, but it really wasn't about that. Um, so, you know, my, my heart lies less in politics and more in people. And I know that you have set up a website where women who aren't included in the film can share their stories. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's storieswomentell.com. And you know, we knew that there was a cumulative effect in ha having, you know, more than just Amy's story in the film, including as many stories as we could. But we also wanted the experience you know, it's hard to overpopulate a film too much and have too many stories in there. So, you know, if we felt like we hit a balance and could have you know, just as many stories as the film could contain. But of course, there are so many stories and, and I hope that this film will have a little bit of a snowball effect and encourage more women to come forward and talk about their circumstances. So we have a place on the website where women can share a story um, and we hope many women will. Yeah, I, I hope so. So I think we can go to some audience questions now. How's it going, Tracy? Hi. My name is Zevi. Uh, my question is, how did you go about creating a documentary about a topic that's so controversial, but still making it seem very humane and not, like when I was watching the trailer, I didn't feel like I was watching a documentary that was about abortion. It was kind of like a documentary that was just tackling uh, like an, an issue. Well, thank you for that. Um, I mean, I think in part, I, I, um, I asked women when I would meet them and, and be with them and observe their circumstances and stories to, to really um, share their lives from an intimate place and not to talk. I mean, they had, had to really um, be able to speak from an I place, you know, to say this is my experience rather than a you place or a, you know, so it had to be first person. So the women who were active in what they describe as the pro-life movement, I, I didn't want to hear the kind of general should or shouldn't. I really wanted to hear where they were coming at this from their personal place, what brought them to where they were. and. So I just kind of, that was a grounding device for me, was that people had to be willing to share their own story, not the kind of issue story, if that makes sense. Hi, uh, thank you for being here. So my question is, um, there has been a lot of controversy about abortions being considered um, murder. What do you say, um, what can you say to these people who have these views? Well, 
you know, I, I don't think I can change anyone's mind on that. Um, I know that I've been in several Q&As with Dr. Aaron, who's an abortion provider, and I've heard her answer that question, that it's really, you know, hard to know that sort of notion of when does life begin, and, you know, for some it begins at conception, and for some, you know, it, it's hard to know, and we don't, we don't know, I guess is what I would say. You know, we, we don't know, and ultimately the life that uh, is most important from my perspective is the life that is th the woman in front of you. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Tracy. This is so cool that you made this. And you brought the billboards, which I've been thinking a lot about, um, honestly, since like the Pulse shooting, because I went to school in Gainesville. And when you drive um, the drive, I'm from South Florida, to, so you drive two hours to Orlando, then from Orlando to Gainesville, it's all the heartbeat starts, b posters nonstop. And I've been thinking a lot about like on campus too, like they would blow up like the bloody baby or the fetuses. And there's no one ever like, hey, maybe you're not ready to have a baby. Or like, how can we take these stories or take, I guess, like the movement you're helping and bring it to college campuses, like as, like me, like what can I do? Yeah, I mean, of course, excuse me, it starts with, I think, um, th there's Planned Parenthoods all over, whether they're able to provide abortion care or not because of various trap laws and all sorts of things, they're, they're still there. The affiliates are all over the country, and I think it starts with reaching out to them um, because they have advocacy wings. They have people within these clinics and healthcare centers that are working on from a policy standpoint, and I know they always need volunteers and always need support whether it's women who really can share their story and put a human face to this, or whether it's women who can, women and men. I'm so, certainly, certainly men can be a part of this um, as escorts. I mean, that role is so key to giving support just on the ground to a woman seeking care. Um, it's invaluable. So I would say those are two things, um, yeah, that you could do. I think we have time for one more question. Hey, Tracy, thank you so much for being here. I do agree that more men should be involved in this process and to help out in whatever way that they can. My question for you, I know you've touched upon it briefly earlier on a political sort of level. Um, I, for one, am very tired of male politicians in general deciding what a female can or cannot do with her body. So, thank you. I mean it. Um, so my question for you is, having this platform of AOL Build, what is one message that you'd like to deliver to them right here, right now? I mean, <laughs> let's see, well, no pressure here, right? How can I, um, I mean, ultimately, I think if we're gonna take it out of the rhetoric and out of, you know, murder or this or that, it, I, you know, it's about, it's about privacy and it's about choice and if, you know, Kathy wants to be on the sidewalk and doesn't want to have an abortion, Godspeed. And if, you know, I want to have an abortion, that's got to be okay too. So I think it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's slightly nuanced, <laughs> unfortunately, it's not, but it's about, it's about choice and it's about privacy. And really, uh, if, without that, women are second class citizens. And that's not okay. I think that's a great note to end on. Thanks so much, Tracy. Yeah.